My favorite topic, anticoagulation on a Sunday morning. Fierkau's triad, endothelial injury, circulatory stasis, and hypercoagulability. Evolution of anticoagulation. Heparin came about somewhere in the 30s. Uh, and then we've got vitamin K antagonists, and then low molecular weight heparins, DTIs, direct thrombin inhibitors, 10A inhibitors, and then the NOACs, which are sort of our most popular treatments now. What's factor one? You got to do this. You have to do this. Hate to do it on Sunday morning. Anybody know what factor one is? You're on. Take a wild guess. Something. What's factor two? Got to know it. Factor six? There is no factor six. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Factor four is calcium. I didn't know that until about a year ago. Factor four is actually calcium. But yeah, there's no factor six. They used to have a name for it for something else. But one is fibrinogen. You can't make a clot without fibrinogen. You can't make fibrinogen into fibrin without thrombin. So one and two are up there at the top of the list. Anticoagulants. Has anybody medically used a leech? Any of you guys? Where do you use? Have you put one on a person? What, how'd you do it? You get a little thing. How'd you get it off? You remember? <laughs> do what? <laughs> Ask the nurses to take it off? Yeah, you can put salt on them, and the salt is what makes them release. Otherwise, they'll just engorge themselves. They'll just keep sucking until they're done. You know, they used to use them on ears quite a bit or uh, nipple replants where the, where the thing gets engorged. It's kind of a weird thing to do, really, with a little, you know, a little medicine cup, dump a leech on. But le leeches are, are really amazing little animals. This is the way they cut. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. They're so clever. Instead of just punching a hole, they cut a, a, a chevron uh, in the, uh, see if I can make that work, I don't know. Yeah, they, see they cut a chevron so it bleeds more persistently. It's a three-bladed, and they have different leeches have different mouths. This is uh, the Herudo medicinalis, uh, and it makes a, ultimately, Thousands and thousands of years ago, or maybe not so long ago, they, they were common. Bleeding was a very common thing. But what does it do for you? What's well, it detoxifies your blood, okay. and you know they have a little enzyme that when they're biting down on you, mm -hmm. it gets released into your blood, and generally you bleed for quite a bit, and uh, you your health is optimized. It detoxifies you, the blood. <laughs> I'm not feeling very detoxified right now. But is, is, it the, is it the enzyme? Is that what's critical? It is. And so they touch it out. They take it. They're in a little jar of water and glass. And they pull it out. And they have to sit yes, down. We do the little sampler first, which is in the belly button. And it crawls in. Oh. And you feel it bite down on you. And you want to go, you bastard. And then, <laughs> and then you relax. You work on like your Lamaze breathing just to kind of relax. It must be quite painful. And then you just watch it swell up and get fatter and fatter. And then when it's super drunk on your blood, it just kind of rolls over like, you know, it's like it's stumbling out of the bar. Make America great again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, so that, that's where they do this. And the, the, uh, yeah, there's all kind of stuff in leech spit that actually uh, prevent, you know, causes anticoagulation. We, the main one we use is herudin, but there are a lot of other agents. There's a thing at the bottom called serotin, which is really pretty interesting uh, in that it's a collagenase, basically, and it actually is what makes that wound continue to bleed. The antithrombin effect, the herudin effect, goes away within about 10 minutes after a leech bites, but the wound continues to bleed. Part of it's because of mechanically that triangular hole doesn't want to seal as easily as like a little slit or a puncture. But part of it is because this collagenase cuts off all of that type 4 collagen that should be hanging out there for, you know, uh, platelets to come kind of stick to. So it kind of passivates the wound so there's nothing there. Platelets don't really see it so they don't stick. There's a lot of opportunity for medical treatments based on this. Of course, you know, that's uh, obviously been done. Got to look at this just for a few minutes. Uh, sort of intrinsic, extrinsic, or surface contact, tissue damage, pathways. You kind of know basically how this works, sort of 12, 11, 9, 10. You know, 10 and 5 are sort of the critical thing. That's the prothrombinase complex. When 10 and 5 and calcium and phospholipid get together, that's what turns on prothrombin. 
once you got thrombin, you've, you've got this, you know, the, the, the real action uh, in clotting. It's the central bioregulatory enzyme in hemostasis. If you know thrombin, you basically know the whole thing. And it's kind of, you know, as a vascular surgeon, you know more about clotting than anybody because you actually look at it. You're looking at the blood in a wound. You give heparin and you're 10 minutes into a case and you start seeing clots form, you know this is, this is not the same. You're, you're not having to call, look at for a PTT or an ACT. You're actually seeing the stuff in the wound. You cut into somebody's skin and you, you, you have a feeling for whether they've got bleeding or not. So you, you probably are as best equipped as anybody in the hospital, including the, 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 hema, you know, the hematologist. Because most hematologists, what do most hematologists do for a living? They treat cancer. Why do they treat cancer? Because they can sell drugs to them. Clotters are kind of this weird sort of, uh, sort of perverted, you know, kind of bunch that they either do child pornography on the weekends or they do clotting. You know, they're, pro they're protein chemists and uh, they, uh, you know, they, they create these, these enzymes and stuff, but it's a very sort of a fuzzy group. You can fit in there well as a vascular surgeon. It's called translational, translational research. Fibrin is very important. Once you got thrombin, it does all kind of stuff. Activates all these precursors in the pathway, turns on platelets. Actually, it's, thrombin is one of the most important activators initially of platelets, which we don't even think about. Uh, we sort of think about that as all related to, uh, you know, aspirin and antiplatelet agents, but antithrombins actually have an impact on platelets. Uh, thrombin activates 5 and A, the two big cofactors in the coagulation cascade. What are the, what's the endogenous inhibitor of factor 5 and 8? It sort of matters. Protein C. Remember protein C from yesterday? Thrombin goes over to the thrombomodulin, hooks on the endothelium, and that activates protein C. Protein C goes back and inhibits 5 and 8A. That's the whole concept of activated protein C as an anticoagulant. So if you're protein C deficient, you can't inhibit 5 and 8, and therefore you don't inhibit your coagulation cascade. A bunch of other stuff that thrombin does. Uh, inhibition of thrombin, we basically use two uh, kinds of thrombin inhibitors. One would be the indirect thrombin inhibitors, and that's essentially heparin, because you, you're really heparin, heparin in the absence of antithrombin does nothing. So, uh, well, it actually does have a little something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, direct thrombin inhibitors, though, are really basically the herudins, the leech spit, because they directly block the active site. So unfractionated heparin, again, if you, and you see this in kids with uh, like, uh, what's that, where they pee protein out, what do they call it, nephrotic syndrome, their AT3 goes down or antithrombin goes down, you give them heparin, it has no impact. It would be a situation where you might give FFP with heparin to actually have a, a thrombotic effect. It's sort of one of those, when do you give FFP to anticoagulate somebody? You have to have a source of antithrombin. That kind of shows what heparin does. Heparin kind of hooks up on uh, uh, antithrombin, and then it, it sterically sort of steers the antithrombin into the active site uh, of the thrombin molecule, whereas direct thrombin inhibitors, you can see on the bottom, they have the ability just to go straight in without that intermediate uh, issue of having uh, antithrombin involved at all. Uh, warfarin, what does it do? 2, 7, 9, and 10, protein C and protein S. Remember, protein C and protein S short half-lives, but they're, they're, they're anticoagulants. So when you first start warfarin therapy, you've got the balance between procoagulants and anticoagulants, and initially you're actually making it procoagulant because you're inhibiting protein C and protein S. It's why you can't give big doses of vitamin K antagonists without an, un, without an overriding uh, heparin-type something to anticoagulate them at the meantime. Otherwise, you wind up with heparin-induced, I mean, uh, uh, warfarin-induced skin necrosis. So you have the unopposed procoagulant effect of these longer acting, you know, seven and nine. Low molecular weight heparins, basically you take heparin, enzymatically chew it up into smaller pieces, and it winds up having an effect mostly on factor 10A as opposed to thrombin. Fondaparinux is essentially a synthetic uh, little five uh, pentasaccharide kind of a little dealy that works as a, essentially it's a uniform kind of low molecular weight heparin. Instead of just kind of randomly chopping heparin from big long molecule into multiple smaller ones, which are kind of randomly sized, Fondaparinux basically just says we're going to take the key uh, 
pentasaccharide segment of that that actually interacts with antithrombin and just make that. Fondaparinux is a very good, very good drug. We don't use it you know, too much, but it's uh, essentially a low molecular weight heparin that's uniform in size. And then the direct thrombin inhibitors, again, back to the leech, the direct thrombin inhibitors that we use basically all derive from herudin. And Argatroban would be the best example of that. The oral direct thrombin inhibitor is Pradaxa. Essentially, that's leech spit, but you can take in a pill. Last little bit we want to talk about is the uh, exas. What's in a generic name? River exaban, river oxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, batrixaban. All of those easy to remember because they're 10A inhibitors, fundamentally 10A inhibitors. Remember, 10A. It's 10 and 5 is prothrombinase complex. 10 turns on prothrombin to thrombin. Once you have thrombin, you've got clot. So that it, this shows it as rivaroxaban, but essentially that's the way all of the 10A inhibitors work. They're stopping that prothrombinase complex, sort of the central enzyme. Once you got that, if you can stop this, it's a better place to stop it because you're earlier in the cascade. Indications. So warfarin's good for everything. The, uh, the uh, others, uh, Pradaxa doesn't have an indication for hip and knee replacement. And this stuff evolves sort of, you know, each spring comes around and these companies will add a new indication as they uh, run a clinical trial. But all of these have basically mainly been focused on the, the uh, non-surgical AFib and DVT treatment. What about uh, chronic kidney disease patients? Uh, if you're Treating them with a NOAC, you're supposed to monitor them every year in stage one, every six months in stage three, every three months in stage four. European guidelines for atrial fib recommend renal function monitoring. Apixaban had surprising approval for DVTPE with no renal adjustment. Uh, you know, I think you basically go to the uh, guidelines if you're, you're not going to be primarily treating AF. None of you are, I think. We'll all defer to a cardiologist, and that's probably the smart thing to do. Uh, so what do we have for reversal? So there is reversal agents now. So for Pradaxa, there's Praxbind, a, an antibody specific for it. Remember, Pradaxa is essentially a direct thrombin inhibitor, Herudin. Warfarin, you, you could give vitamin K or FFP. Uh, we were taught when I was a resident not to give vitamin K for uh, warfarin reversal because of a sort of an all or none effect. It's pretty hard to titrate vitamin K to reverse uh, warfarin. We tend to overdose, and so then you've got no, you know, uh, procoagulants. It's it's very procoagulant, so you sort of shift from nothing to something. And for instance, if somebody's on a warfarin, they've got a mechanical heart valve, and you give them a bunch of vitamin K, and they thrombose their heart valve, it's probably not a good thing. So we had kind of a prohibition against doing that because with FFP, you can sort of sneak your way up, as opposed to just slamming the door. Uh, and and then once you're once you've gotten all that vitamin K on board, then you've got to work your way back in terms of reversal. So personally, I think using FFP or k Centra is a better way to uh, reverse warfarin than just big doses of vitamin K. Heparin, you know we give protamine. Protamine is basically, heparin's big negative thing, protamine's big positive thing, and then they kind of glom together and it sort of sucks all the heparin out of the system to be non-functional. Uh, the reversal agent for river oxaban just came out, I think was approved in May, I think this year, called Andexa. It's an antibody. I'm not sure exactly. It was basically tested for river oxaban and apixaban. Uh, I don't think it specifically says the other two, Cerveza or Bavixa, but uh, I don't think there's any reason why it wouldn't work. Maybe somebody knows in the room that it's not supposed to be used with them, but I think most people would try it if they just absolutely had to have a reversal agent for the other anti-10A agents. Uh, when oral anticoagulation is initiated in a patient with non-valuable atrial filament, it's eligible for a NOAC, and NOAC is recommended in preference to a vitamin K antagonist. So this is uh, pretty recent uh, European recommendations. And for venous thromboembolism and no cancer, as long-term anticoagulant therapy, we suggest dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or adoxaban over other vitamin K antagonists. So they're clearly, you know, the NOACs really are coming in as the, the primary anticoagulant. If you have cancer, what would be your long-term anticoagulant typically? Low molecular weight heparin. Okay, so you, that's, you typically don't use warfarin if you have cancer. So for ongoing cancer, uh, typically use uh, 
the uh, low molecular weight heparins. Who shouldn't get a NOAC? Contraindication or lack of data, active significant bleeding, probably a good idea, prosthetic heart valve, spinal procedures, known hypersensitive to NOACs, uh, pregnant and breastfeeding, caution or care in patients with liver disease, disorders of hemostasis, stably anticoagulated on warfarin. If it's working and it's cheap, why not do it? Uh, and you can look up the, the crossovers and, and uh, drug reactions, interdrug reactions. That's the main stuff I wanted to talk about on that. Uh, any sort of questions on coagulation? You know, it's a, it's a funny area. It really is a funny area because they're really uh, clotters are, you'd be lucky in your hospital if you have a hematologist who's got a real interest in anticoagulation. And, and, and again, as a, as a vascular surgeon, you may be in the best position to sort of answer a lot of these questions. So it's, I think it's worthwhile having a rough idea of how these drugs work. 